Don Grant Smith from um, Plant Food Research at Lincoln, uh, New Zealand. Uh, Lincoln's just south of Christchurch, halfway down the South Island. Um, I also have a quite large role in the uh, Plant Biosecurity CRC, Australian based. And um, what I'm going to present now is the part three of the uh, research effort from um, us in New Zealand and the guys at North Dakota State about trying to develop diagnostics for uh, Liberibacter solanaceae So again, um, we get a lot of support to, to run this. It's the same um, acknowledgement that Rebecca showed, but in particular, um, we acknowledge the support of our entomological colleagues in particular to support um, our efforts. And also, this is part of a, a far larger project that's run by Jim Stack, current director of the Great Plains Diagnostic Network out of Kansas State, uh, looking at um, new, new ways to do bacterial pathogen diagnosis. And we've got the, the only unculturable one in it, so we've got the real hard job of trying to get to grips with um, what is this bacterium. Um, what I'd like to do is just start with um, one of the issues that we have with uh, biosecurity. I've got a large biosecurity role. And part of the problem we have in biosecurity is biosecurity reacts to names. And we know bacteria and other taxa exchange genes. And the best example, current example we currently have of uh, getting it wrong is in Australia right now. And that's the invasion of myrtle rust into Australia. You, you got anyone from Hawaii who's been visited Hawaii would know it as guava rust. It's known as eucalyptus rust in South America. It arrived in Australia and was diagnosed incorrectly as Eurido ranglii. There was an action plan. The Australians were ready for it. They had an action plan. They knew what they were going to do. The action plan depended on the correct identification. The identification was wrong. The action plan wasn't initiated. And Puxinia sedi has actually got away. It's now infecting about 2,500 kilometres worth of um, uh, native vegetation from Queensland down to New South Wales. Uh, it's got an extensive host range. It's not, a, it's not a usual rust. It's infecting over 300 species in the 51 genera in the Myrtaceae, which is an iconic... Um, um, it's one of the... It's seen as a mega diversity for Myrtaceae as Australia. And the last talk I was at, the Australian scientists were talking about the distinct possibility of species extinction of uh, a number of iconic Australian tree species. Um, and I suspect it's going to be mass species extinction if it keeps going the way it is. So that's what happens if you get the name wrong. So we're trying to move away from that, and names keep changing. Shedomonas, Ralstonia, Burkholdia, they're constantly being renamed, uh, but the lists don't, don't get updated. And we're trying to move to a sequence-based um, biosecurity system where it relies less on the name but more, is the sequence present, react to the sequence. So in particular, it's about identification of core sequences. Just while I'm on Australia, um, Australia is, the, is one centre of uh, mega diversity on, on the planet. It's also got a fairly low po human population base. And probably the most interesting thing out of all of these figures, in particular for you, Andy, is about a quarter of the psyllid species in the world are in Australia. And most of them aren't particularly well characterised at all, uh, including one which has made a, a, a um, host range shift off a uh, nat native Australian plant onto solanaceous egg plant which, of course, has got consequences all on its own. So you've seen, this, you've seen this slide before from Rebecca, but just to remind you of the reason that we got, got into this in particular was why, was why was zebra chip less severe in New Zealand? We might st and we're starting to understand that a little bit more now because we've got A, but we, at that point in time we were, we were thinking that we may have had a, a fairly limited genetic sampling of the diversity of Liberia back into New Zealand. You remember it? It came into New Zealand uh, in, two, in um, well, it was first identified in 2008, so it arrived in 2006. Um, and right now, the the current descriptor is this thing called haplotype. I mean, that really is based on a very, very, very small part of the genome, and it doesn't really describe. Our, the, the ribosomal regions do not describe biology or pathology, and so. I don't believe it's a good diagnostic region for what we're looking for. Uh, you've seen this before, so just to remind you that, that 1A from New Zealand off a psyllid from Tamarillo colony, 1A from 
US from the potato out of Texas, and of course comparison back to ZC1. So what I'm going to do now is pick up from where Rebecca finished was with the identific identification of those unique author logs and talk about how we then develop some differential diagnostics based on those author logs to get down to some, um, some things which we think are clearly di discriminating between A and B at a very different level from what you can normally see. So I'll talk about the, the process and then f and finally run you through some of the assays that we, that we did. So what we did was we were able to start with, um, we had uh, out of our in silico um, genomic screen, we had 145 coding and 135 non-coding. So this is on the basis, coding's on the basis of those annotations, the RAST annotations that Rebecca talked about. So we went through some filters to get down to 30 and 14, so that's a blast screen, so that's, a, that's looking for things that are similar or dissimilar in the databases. And ultimately we ended up with 44 sets for qPCR screening. So initially we start off with these 145, 135, uh, they came out of uh, these reciprocal blasts. That's where you take sequences. You have two lists of sequences, A and B, and you blast everything. You compare everything to everything. And only the things that are different don't actually have a hit in the other list is what you keep. You throw away all the things that, are not, that, are, that have any le level of similarity. Remember, you're comparing two things that are really, really close. So we're looking for things that, are, that, that discriminate two taxa units, which are actually very, very close. Um, so there's some parameters there in terms of, of how we set it up. Uh, this E value, expect value, that's a very, very robust uh, test. We're actually looking for things that are highly dissimilar, but we're making sure that we've got at least 70% coverage. So we're not looking for things that are just noise in the system at both levels. That's what it looks like when we, when we map them. This is uh, mapped against, uh, that's NZ1. Um, so these regions are relatively uh, uniformly distributed around the genome, uh, both the coding and non-codings. We then put them through this blast screen, so that's to, again, test for similarities. We relax this expect value a little bit because now we're looking for not things that are really, really close. We're looking for things that are in, in, the, in the region. Most of these got dropped out by hitting on other library vectors that are in the databases, so the Asiaticas, is the, those. And then we start to see, well, we start to get a bit, of, bit more clustering. It's starting to only, most of them are starting to appear in just one half of the genome. I don't know the reason for that, but that's, that's what we found. And then finally, we boiled it down to 12 targets. And many of these targets are what, are, what we're referring to these phage remnant regions. So these, these are regions which the annotation and other clues are saying to us that's where a prophage has excised or a phage has jumped into the genome and then jumped out again and left part of itself behind. They're scattered all throughout the genome, these, these phage remnants. But most of the ones we, most of the regions that we identified using this process are associated with phage remnants, where phage have come in and out of the bacterial genome. Um, quite interesting, but can't offer an explanation right now. Primers were uh, selected using a fairly standard process. Uh, Primer 3 is a well-known program. We've just got a plug-in and, and Genius that we use. Uh, they're the parameters for it. We're looking to run qPCR. We're looking for a sort of a qPCR Q -P size. And we're trying to get the GC content up to 50%. And if you recall from Rebecca's talk, the average GC content on these genomes is 35%. So it's a bit of a challenge trying to find primer pairs that can work. Once your GC drops in a primer, it starts to do funny things. Um, and that's to set up 40 cycles through a, a qPCR machine. So this is what success looks like. This is D243. It's, to a, it's, it's hitting on a hypothetical protein. Uh, the, the primers were made. And what I'm showing you here is both the amplification curves, the melt curves, and we also ran them out on gels. So we got three looks at it. So the amplification curves are good. The melt curves, because all these things are melting at the same point, they're all amplifying the same product from the different samples, but they're all amplifying A. Okay? And we can see nice, clean products on the gel. Now initially, we have actually put this one aside, but um, on reflection, 
I'm not sure we did it for the right reason. This one has nice curves, and even in here, you'll see this, this B, it's amplifying a B sample, that's in here. But it's amplifying it very, very late. And as uh, Chris and others have, have explained, there are uh, dual um, infections of A and B. This one appears to be uh, picking up some form of a B in the sample that we were using to do the initial screen. And it looks like it's picking up the same thing because that melt profile is quite similar. It's, 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 it's running up at the same point. So we've put that one aside, but we might come back and visit it um, a little bit later. Again, this one is a non-coding. Um, this was hitting on non-coding. And when you're developing diagnostics, you have failures. And this is, a, this is an example of a failure. You really just only have to look up here to see you've just got a, we've just got a big smear. So we didn't get any specific amplicons, and that's backed up by these funny sort of shapes and these, all these melt curves all over the place, saying this one just didn't work. The bioinformatics told us that this should work, but it didn't. And you see that quite often in, in diagnostics where things just don't work. Uh, that one's been discarded. So we end up with these 12 um, selected targets. Um, and they were run through uh, our initial mini panel. And all these 12 are all good for both the New Zealand A and either TPP or potato or the USA sample we had from Chris. And they all don't pick up USB and they also do not pick up either the insect or potato. Um, the other interesting thing is you look at them, most of them are hypothetical proteins. There's only one named protein in there, or sorry, uh, coding region, not protein, sorry. Phage terminase, and that's again reflecting the fact that a lot of these are coming out of these phage remnants. So clearly a bit of phage terminase has been left in a funny part of the genome when, uh, when excision. Now, and there's also two non-codings. Um, so I, I mean, I've been doing diagnostics since last millennium. Um, I would never have gone and, and targeted a hypothetical protein for a diagnostic reason. But you, just wouldn't, you just wouldn't feel comfortable doing it because you don't know enough about what it is. But by applying this bioinformatical approach, that's what's come out, is these, hy these, these, these regions that are quite small, Rebecca described them, you know, they're, they're about 200 base pairs, 70 amino acids or so. We don't know anything about what they do, but they are discriminating really clearly between A and B in this mini panel. So are they driving some of the biological differences between A and B at this point? Don't know. Um, so as Chris, Chris noted um, previously, uh, we sent a bunch of um, primers up to him, and he's run them through his, uh, his massive big um, sample set, and we get similar results. So when we get exposed into a bigger data set, we get similar results. We get some clear AB differentials. We get some mixed amplifications like that um, DNC75 possible failure, and, and we've got to go back and have a look at those and see whether that's a consequence of mixed, and mixed um, sample. And we get some failures. So on a bigger data set, some of these ones start to drop out a little bit because Chris has got access to far bigger uh, sampling of uh, the Liberia back to genetic diversity than we have right now. So, but the question for me, um, and trying to sort of tie together the three talks, is what do those mixed amplifications failures mean? Does it mean differential diagnostic failure? I don't believe it does. I don't believe it, that, that the system's actually failing. It could be a consequence of mixed type, especially if one of them is in fairly low titer, so they're getting a very late amplification curve, like I showed you in, in the example. But I also believe that there's possibly what we're looking at is some sort of intermediary type genomes outside those regions that we define haplotype that are possibly the consequence of either gene flow or genetic diversity or evolution, and they represent intermediates in terms of what we might call an A and a B genome. Because right now, realistically, we've got one B clearly defined and two A's that are in pretty good shape. But I th I'm interpreting the, the data that, that we've got and the data that Chris has got as saying, I think there's stuff going on between them and, and there's intermediaries that exist between, well, at least 
right now. They're the two um, bookends for the diversity that we have until we can sample and, and um, sequence and assemble some more genomes and have a look at them. So in summary, um, we've identified 44 unique genome dispersed sequences and we've completed the initial tests in our um, qPCR and 12 of them we've taken on further. Most of them are targeting these annotated regions, these genes, but most of them are targeting genes that we don't know anything about and, we, and right now there's nothing like them anywhere in, in, the, in the databases. What we have done is, is established that we do have a working uh, process, of a, a pipeline that we can use to extend this, um, extend the differential assays to, to other um, Liberia vector genomes. Um, and I think what we're really starting to see is, in particular, perhaps going back to the, the discussion about um, Tarek's um, hybrids, insect hybrids, you know, it's, it's always going to show the haplotype of the female. Um, I think the ribosomal RNA assay is actually probably leading slightly, slightly astray, and the, hapl the haplotype uh, assays are actually coincidental with, but do not describe the complexity that I think we're starting to be able to see with these, with these type of um, bioinformatic driven approaches to looking at the genome. Um, like any good piece of research, it's generating a lot of questions that we currently don't have answers to. Um, we do now believe we've got a, a system that we can now work to, um, to, to investigate. But um, for me right now, the, the issue is I, I, we still can't answer the question, though we do have, even though we've got evidence that, that the A in New Zealand, you know, it's got the three prophages and we think there's only two prophages on the current assemblies in, in the USA that we've, that we've sampled, the, the New Zealand A is different from the USA, but they're, both, but they're a lot closer together than they are from the, from the B. Um, still don't know whether the, 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 the limited symptomology and the less consequences of zebra chip infection in New Zealand is a consequence of having that sampling of the, of the Liberia genome in New Zealand. So thank you very much. <laughs>